Boston, the Victory Garden, with Bob Thompson. Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. I want to talk to you today about planting a live Christmas tree. We'll also go to Florida to visit the greenhouses of Herman Engelman. And I want to talk to you about holiday plant care. And I want to discuss a problem or two in our plant clinic. But first, I want to talk about mulching the perennial bed. You can see that I was just cutting off some, some uh, fir boughs off of this uh, Christmas tree that is no longer of any use. And I'm putting them over here, over the salt marsh hay that is over our perennials. But before I go any further, I want to show you what the perennials look like under the mulch of hay. You can see that the plants are still green, but that's not really the important thing. We're not trying to keep them green, but if they are green, that's okay. I'll fold the mulch back over, and, and then I'm just using up these nice boughs just simply to help hold that mulch in place and keep it from blowing away and add a little more density to the mulch. Now, the reason for mulching, if the ground is open, uh, and we put the mulch down fine. Then the mulch helps to keep the frost from going deeply into the ground. However, if the ground is frozen and we put a mulch down, it keeps the ground frozen uh, all through the winter. And that's fine too, because the purpose of a mulch is to keep the ground in a stable condition and to prevent it from freezing and thawing and heaving small plants like I just showed you out of the ground, breaking their root systems and ultimately killing the plant. So mulching is a very important thing to do. Now, let's talk about a live Christmas tree. I've got one here, and it's a white spruce. I'll move it over here so we can see it a little better. And it's about four feet tall, and you can see it has an earth ball. It has a root system. This tree will, if it's properly handled, will live and grow for many years to come. Now, the trick with a tree like this is to dig the hole ahead of time, because if you live in the northern part of the country, the ground may well be frozen uh, long before you're ready to plant the tree. And when you dig the hole, you should fill it with hay. And you fill it with hay to keep the, the uh, soil in the hole from freezing and, and everything is ready to plant. So we just simply move the tree over to the hole, get a good firm grip on the trunk itself, move it over close to the hole, get yourself positioned so that you're sort of straddling the hole and you can see that I hope that I've prepared a little bit of a mound in the bottom of the hole to receive the uh, earth ball so that when I set it down on that mound, the tree is nice and straight. If it isn't, I can just tamp it a little bit. Then I'll take a planter board. You could use a rake handle or shovel handle just to check the depth. It's just a little below grade, so that's perfect. Now, because I, I thought the ground would be frozen and I couldn't leave soil outside i brought the soil inside in one of these wagons and it didn't freeze and i can just add it back in around the earth ball now i'll put enough dirt around to stabilize and that's all i'll do at this particular minute i'll then come back and i'll give this a drink of water i'll let it settle in then i'll add more soil then I'll put the hay that was in the hole around the base of the tree over the newly placed soil, and that tree will be in great shape. The ground will stay fairly open, and the tree will have access to uh, soil moisture all through the winter. This will get to be a big tree. In 10 years, it'll be bigger than that blue spruce over in our landscaped area. So if you don't have the space, don't try to do something like this. You've got to have enough room, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Now, those of you who uh, didn't have a chance to dig a hole and the ground is frozen, take your live tree and put it maybe in an area, let's say there weren't any perennials here, in an area like this where it would be protected from the wind and every couple of weeks give it a drink of water, maybe mound some leaves over it, and I think you'll bring it through very nicely. Well, so much for trees. Last spring we visited the greenhouses of Herman Engelman down in Apopka, Florida. And Herman is one of the leading introducers of hybrid indoor plants. I'd like you to come with me and we'll take a look. Herman, I'm really pleased with the, this range of greenhouses you have here. It's just as clean as a whistle and uh, it's unusual to see one that is so nice. In order to grow a healthy plant, you have to be almost hospital clean. As you can see, 
all the walks are constantly awake. Right. We use chemicals to clean the walkways. We sterilize our beds. We sterilize the pots. We have to be hospital clean in order to grow the plants we do grow. So it's pure sanitation and, and I, I suppose, orderliness of, of work. Sanitation is yeah. very important indeed here. But, uh, you know, coming from the north, I, I'm kind of surprised when I come to Florida. I look upon Florida as being a warm state 12 months of the year. And I come down and you've got greenhouses here that are very well built. They're sturdy. They have ventilating systems and heating systems. And I'm really kind of surprised that they are as, as strong as they are. To explain that in order to grow the plants healthy and clean, you need controlled environments. And as you know, we have air conditioning in the summer for our plants, for the greenhouses. We have the right light filter. Uh, we, we have to screen some of the, uh, the sun heat, rays sure. out. And again, in the winter, we have to heat because the temperatures are uh, cool or even cold here in Florida. Are you looking for an optimum temperature of 50 or 60 degrees, something like that? The optimum temperature to grow the plants is between 72 and 75 ah, degrees. That's, that's that quite warm. That would be the optim uh, optimum temperature and to grow the plants. And you just can't take any chances, can you? Could no, we stop we here and, oh, and, and look at some of these? You've got so many nice things here. Uh, I'm anxious to have you show me Yes, as gladly. much as you can. Right here, we have new hybrids of euphorbias. They are hybrids, hybridized in Germany. They are all, all kinds of different varieties, different colors, as you can, say, can see. We of have course. a red one here. We have a yellow one here. We have a pink one here. They're beautiful. The strain, the original species, was found in Madagascar. But the hybridizing was done in Germany, and the men started about 10 years ago to hybridize those different varieties. All right, this is a relative of the crown of thorns, as we it's know. It's a relative of the crown of thorn, and here you can see one of the original crown of thorns. Oh, yeah, okay, and that really is thorny. That's very thorny, yep. and the flower is much smaller than the new I varieties. See. I see. I'm very enthusiastic about it, and that's one of the reasons the plant is going to be patented in America which gives us exclusive rights to propagate the plants. It's a beautiful plant. I see that you have a group of them growing it in what I would consider to be a small window box. Does that mean that the plant can grow outside in, in warm weather? It could, but the temperature should be at least 55 or 60. If the temperature is much lower, the plant would damage. I see. So certainly even up north during the, the two or three really warm months of the summer to be okay outside. It could be grown outside. It could be grown on a patio and in full sunlight. Right. Now, if you, bring in, uh, if you bring the plants into the house and it's too dark, yeah. the plant won't flower and it won't have beautiful flowers. You might have one or two flowers, but it won't flower as well. Right. So it should be in a light, in a sunny spot. Let me ask you this. Let's assume we give it just exactly the right conditions. It's warm enough and it's in bright light. How long, how many months of the year will the plant bloom? The plant blooms all the time. I've never seen, it, uh, seen that particular strain without a flower. Oh, I love it. I think it's, it's a wonderful nice. plant. I, I'm very excited. Oh, it. I am too. This is the first time I've seen it and I really like it. And again, there are 30 different varieties and uh, the, the varieties don't just vary in color, they also vary in height. There are some which are large and there are some real dwarfs. Boy, I think you have a winner. Uh, before we go too far, this to me looks like another euphorbia. It is a euphorbia. It's a euphorbia which I found in Denmark. It does flower, it has a small yellow flower, but it does not really, uh, uh, the flower's not really that beautiful. You primarily grow this as a, as a foliage plant. Correct, uh, as a foliage plant. Almost looks like a cactus, doesn't it? It, it, it is, is in so the cactus. Uh, right, sure, it's a succulent, sure. Right. It's a right. succulent, right. Very nice. I have to admit, I like the, the other ones that are flowering better, though. Out in front here, uh, big, big pot of Fetonia. A variety that I'm not really familiar with, a very small leaf, delicately veined with white veins. It's a miniature Fetonia, which I found in Denmark about five years ago. I brought it to America, started to propagate it, and now it's one of our major commercial varieties, one of the major varieties we are shipping. Very, very pretty. It's a very nice plant. As you can see, it's very compact. It does not get too tall. It does tolerate low light. And... It's just a pretty variety, as you can see. I would have guessed that that plant would have taken bright light, but you say it tolerates low light and does it very does well. It does tolerate low huh. light. I'm pleased. But of course, every plant has the ideal light, and the ideal light is never very too dark, right. as you know. Now, 
this, I would guess, is a zebra plant. I'm not familiar with the variety for sure. Yes, that is a zebra plant. It's uh, a, a Palo zebra plant. It has a very beautiful texture. The foliage is very heavy and very thick. You can mm. see the... It's almost like leather, isn't it? It is almost like leather. The under... Purplish on the underside. Is, the underside is purplish. Yeah. Now, here you have a comparison between the regular zebra okay, plant... Okay, that's the one I'm familiar with. ...and the new zebra plant, the Apollo plant. Right. Again, it's a very sturdy plant. It holds up a lot better in the house than the regular zebra plant. How about light? It can tolerate lower light than the regular zebra ah. plant. It can. Again, I'm going to point out a lot of plants with heavy textures. And the plants with heavy textures do hold up better in, in, the, in the house. So this is sort of a new trend that you're looking for anyway as a plantsman when you go around looking right. at plants in when other I countries. I think about it. Every time I go, I, I touch the leaves right. and see how thick the foliage That's is interesting. in comparison with other water. Yeah. Interesting. Now, one that's been around for a long time, I guess. I know it's a peperomia. I don't know what variety it is. It's a MR Drupal peperomia, and it was found here by a local grower. It's a, a peperomia with a, with a nice variation, and I think it's kind of neat. Mm, it here is. Here you can see a reversion. Put the two leaves together. Okay. Right here. Here, here you can see the original MR Drupal peperomia. So it does revert back to the uh, uh, right. MR triple peperomia. And as you can see, it's called autumn, autumn leaves. leaves right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this one here, oh, yes. got to take a peek at this. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's another peperomia. It's a, it's a brand new peperomia. And I don't think that's uh, the only plant on, on the American continent. And it was hybridized in Belgium. As you can see, it has almost a rainbow color, and it's just a beautiful variety. And what I would like to point out, the color of the stems, which is very red. R reddish, which right. Which makes a yeah. very attractive house plant. No, that's, that's interesting. We've had plants now, I think the first one you said from Madagascar into right. West Germany. Then we talked about uh, uh, plants from Denmark. And, uh, and this one here came from where? Was this Denmark? No, that came from Belgium. From Belgium. Okay, right. so we've Denmark, Belgium, West Germany, Madagascar. Florida. Florida. <laughs> Can't forget Florida. Right. Gee, that's interesting. Are the Europeans doing more uh, about developing new plants uh, than we are perhaps in this country? Uh, I would say they specialize more in, they, they don't have the varieties we have over here. I they see. specialize more in one particular variety. And uh, what I do, I go to Europe about four times a year and somehow I always find a new variety and uh, which I bring over to America. That's but interesting. the varieties which I do bring over are superior to the varieties right. we have right now. Well, I think you're doing a great job. I, I love those. Oh, yes. And he has a new Diefenbachia, and it's, has again, a very, very heavy texture. It has a very heavy leaf, yeah. and it's proven that it's much tougher in the house. Quite honestly, I have not realized that leaf texture was as important as you're bringing out in this little conversation we're having today, and I can, I can see by feeling that it does make quite a difference. And, and there's a density to that plant, too, that uh, I haven't noticed with other... Oh, yes, it's vacuums. freely branching, as you can see. Every, right here, you can see that every single stem has yep. about 10 different breaks, but just see very the thick. sturdiness yep. of the stem. Mm. And the color, very, very, coloration is great. It's a very nice plant. Really I'm nice. very pleased with it, and it's going to be on the market in a year or two. So people really have something to look forward to on I that. I think so. Right. Now, this looks like uh, a dish garden, and the only dish gardens that I'm really familiar with are the ones that come in sort of a little ceramic, uh, sort of a shallow dish. There's always a sense of area, and there'd be uh, two or three other plants in it, and after a few weeks, the only plant that's still alive is the sense of area, Correct. which right. is not too pretty to begin right. with. And you've got a dish garden here that I, uh, I would assume it's a dish garden because you've got at least three, maybe four plants in that in that little pot as you can see it's a totally uh, it's a totally new concept what i developed a planter yeah just an open pot an open okay. pot with four inserts with four quarts and what you can do is you can create your own dish garden you can put four different plants together first we started with the ivy right we put a, a euphorbia in now we can use a tracena 
and maybe as a larger plant in the Let's background, in another Dracaena. Okay. Or how about taking the throat and this okay. might put a beautiful color combination <laughs> together. <laughs> That's a beauty. Yeah, now you have a dish garden, and every pot, every variety, I, I mean, is in its own env environment. The roots are in their own pot. Now, what would happen if the plants would get too big? You can take that croton right here. Take it away. Take okay. it away and repot it into dump a it, larger pot size. Dump it right out of this little, this little take pot. Take it out of the pot. Pot it up in a four-inch pot or something bigger right. even. You can put it into a larger pot and you have an individual plant. But what you also could do in case of if one of the plants would die, yes. you can empty the container. You can go to a garden center and go to a store, purchase a small plant, we pot it and have a complete garden again. Okay, so the trick there is to save the the little empty pot and yes. get a small one to replace it. You can keep the dish garden going indefinitely. Correct. Great idea. Terrific. And if you are interested in numbers, we involve about 32 different plant varieties for that dish garden. And they're and all relatively compatible. They are all compatible. Great. And with those 30 varieties, we can make up to 12,000 different combinations. <laughs> Yes. You must have a computer to figure that out. That was a computer. That's beyond, that was a beyond human comprehension. Here is a very new plant. It's a new grape ivy. The name of it is Fionia. As you can see, that's the it's small so one. much. Okay. That's oh, the other. This is the old one. Okay. That's the old one right yeah. here. That's yeah. the uh, Ellen Danica. Yeah. Which is very nice, which we sell and we grow a lot of. But you can see the striking difference between the, the two The leaves varieties. are bigger. The, the leaves are bigger, and heavier. again, right. the leaf is much thicker. Yeah, I can see that. Than on here. Mm. I still like this one very much. I, do I can too. see a big improvement here, though. Right. And let me hold this up for a minute. Please. Oh, boy. Now, that is very dense. That's more dense than most grape ivies, isn't it? Ones that I'm familiar with. Of course, we try to grow the best possible yeah. quality. Mm. And, uh, if, of course, what you've got to recognize, uh, too, is if you buy a plant which is not dense, you don't have an, mm, too many cuttings sure. in the pot. And now, here we have awful lot of cuttings in. As I was looking through this plant, yes. just sort of quickly and a little more deliberately now, I don't see anything that even a, looks like a mealybug or a spider mite or anything very clean. No. And people do have trouble with insects on their house plants. Mm. Got any advice? Yes, we have a sign outside, uh, outside the greenhouse that say, no insects, please. No insects. <laughs> right. Now, we have very uh, good spray programs, and we just don't have any problems with insects or disease. Are you saying that a person, when they buy a plant, if they buy a, a plant that is nice and clean and free from insects to begin with, right. uh, chances are much better that they won't have problems in their own home? Except, of course, if they bring it into a plant collection, which is totally yeah. deceased, yeah. then you spread the red spider. That's or always a problem. Bugs. Right. That would be the problem, but we try to be as uh, as clean as possible. Yes, here we have a new lipstick plant, a new echinanthus. The flower is about three times the size. That is not the flower, that's just the bud, as you can ah, see. So as but that opens, it gets bigger and bigger. It gets bigger and right. bigger, and again, this heavy can feel, heavy, heavy texture of the foliage. This has been a study in leaf texture today. Thank you. And I can appreciate what you're saying very right. much because I think it's something that but we've overlooked. But for stay in business, we have to look for improvement. Absolutely. It's just like growing corn. You have to look for improvement. Keep selecting the best You've all the time. You've got to select the best. That's important. Now, here's a very beautiful plant. It's a new Fitzedra, as you know, tree ivy, which is a lot more compact than the other ones. Upright the growth, right? As you can see, the internodes are rather close together here. Yep. Again, the texture of the leaves is much heavier. It has quite a density to it. It has a big density to it. Mm. it it's a plant which does tolerate a certain amount of uh, dark. So you're saying it can grow in, in, in a house. fairly low light condition. Okay, that's great because people are always looking for those kind of plants. And as you look into that plant, uh, you can see the density. Mm. And now, if we wanted to keep that from growing any taller, can we nip it back? Yes, all you have to do is nip it back. That's all you have to do. Mm. But again, if you bring it into the house, it won't grow as well as it would grow here in the greenhouse. Oh, of course not. Conditions are ideal right. here. I even feel like I've grown a couple of inches this afternoon. Oh, really? <laughs> Let's move along. And uh, you have to tell me about these crotons because they're some of the nicest I've ever seen. Okay, why didn't you ask me why people don't use more crotons? Okay, I think that's a good question. Uh, 
because I think it's a beautiful plant and I think I can sort of tell you why people don't grow more crotons because we get a lot of, of questions from viewers on the Victory Garden and right. an awful lot of the questions deal with crotons and they say, how can I control leaf drop on my crotons? I bring a beautiful plant into my, into my living room and it just doesn't last very long. The leaves fall off. Crotons, the crotons you see here, we have about up to 12 different varieties right, right. now are hybridized in greenhouse conditions. They are hybridized in, uh, by the way, they come from Italy, those new crotons. So we've introduced one more country. Right. We have a uh, United Nations of plants and we've just been down maybe 30 feet of a row here. Correct. But they were hybridized for indoor use. Yeah. The crotons you are familiar with are really outdoor crotons. In the south, they use the outdoor ones as ground covers and mass Correct. plantings. And all those crotons, when they come to the north, they just drop the leaves. They even I drop see. foliage in the stores right. and in the boxes. Right. But those crotons are hybridized for indoor use, and they are going to be one of the biggest house plants. Uh, I think crotons are going to be bigger than uh, Diefenbach here. I don't see how you could beat the color. They're just again, beautiful. Again, if you yeah. don't mind, let Not me point bit. out that new croton. It's called Petra. And again, the foliage is very heavy, and it just doesn't drop foliage. Once again, we're talking about the heaviness of the leaf. Right, and it, when you bring that indoors, yeah. in a northern condition, it just doesn't drop the foliage. Of course, it should have a certain temperature. It should not be sure. much below 60 degrees. I see, so it likes kind of warm, warm yes, conditions. Right. right. But and it can tolerate below, a little bit below 60. Right. It, you know what's interesting to me? You've shown me a big leaf. It lo almost looks like a, a rubber plant or right. a rhododendron. And here we have a very thin leaf. And over here we have a leaf that's sort of in between the two, and yet they're all crotons. Right, they're all crotons. They come in hundreds, uh, hundreds of different varieties, right. but again, the crotons you sort uh, during the tours today are all crotons which are hybridized for indoor use, and they definitely don't drop the foliage. I'm very impressed. I want to have you tell me about this one oh, last yes. plant. Here we have a new um, Aurelia. As you know, the original Aurelia, Aurelia elegantissima, is grown through seed. Yes. That uh, does not develop uh, flowers, that does not set seeds. So the only way to propagate that is through cuttings. Okay, so this is a hybrid. That's a hybrid. And right it's here. much more densely branched and formed than the Aurelia elegantissima. Plus, and I would, would almost say, it's almost like the croton. The original Aurelia, they always drop the foliage, they right. always drop the leaves, but they don't. They are really hybridized. I can see you've made an awful lot of, between your travels and selecting plants from different parts of the world and what you've done right here in Florida and other growers have done in Florida, you've done a terrific job of improving many, many of the plants that we all should be growing more in our homes. I think you should. If you grow those plants we are bringing in, you're going to be more successful in growing them in indoors. Herman, it's really been a pleasure to a be pleasure. with you today. I appreciate it very much. You've you got some wonderful things. Well, there may be better growers around than Herman Engelman, but uh, if there are, I haven't met them. What really impressed me down there was the number of varieties of plant material that they were growing and the absolute cleanliness and sanitation of the whole operation. The plants were properly spaced, and they were well-groomed, and they were free of insects and diseases. You can't do much better than that. We in our own homes can do a good job of taking care of our plants, too, if we'll watch out for dead leaves and if we'll inspect the plants frequently for insect damage and if we'll sort of space them properly, if we'll take care of them, they'll do very well for us. Let's move right in and talk about some holiday plants. Here's an azalea that we've had around in the, in the Victory Garden for three years. And an azalea likes to have moist soil, good bright location, and cool temperature. And after the flowers go by, I would feed it with an acid-forming uh, type of a fertilizer with a high middle number for about five or six months each month you know, for five or six months, and uh, that will make this plant do very, very well. It's a plant that we can keep around for many, many years. We have to watch out and give it enough water because it does have a tendency to dry out rather quickly, especially in a dry house over the winter. Now, coming along to another azalea, and this one here is, to me, is an absolutely beautiful thing. It's a grafted head onto a, an upright standard or a, or a rootstock, and I think you have to agree the flowers are absolutely beautiful. And all azaleas, after they flower, or as soon as they begin to flower, they begin to send out new <coughs> shoots. And these new shoots, of course, are the wood that will flower next year. And what I like to do is, as the plant, it's a little early to do it now, but when the plant gets through flowering, I'll prune these back a little bit 
and I'll sort of tighten up the head and then as the new growth comes out it'll be rather even new buds will set and next year it'll be even prettier than it is now I think it's a beautiful plant now here's one that uh, everybody knows I'm sure the poinsettia native to Mexico the plant breeders have done such a good job of, of uh, breeding and crossbreeding and hybridizing the poinsettia that they are extremely tough. They'll bloom for at least six months in, in the average house with, without a heck of a lot of care. They need bright light. They need to be kept moist. Again, if we don't keep them moist enough, they'll begin to collapse on us. I wouldn't even bother to feed it because they're very, very tough. By June, I'm sick of my poinsettias and I throw them away. You may wish to keep yours longer, but I think it's a plant that is a temporary plant rather than a permanent plant. Uh, plants that are permanent are the whole group of amaryllis. I think you can see what a beautiful cluster of flowers there is on this one. And again, they're easy to grow. They're very tolerant of, of light and temperature. Although they definitely prefer bright light and they definitely need to be watered rather frequently. But they can almost be neglected and they still survive because they're very, very genetically tough. Once the flower stalk goes by, simply take a razor blade and just cut it off at the base and then all the energy goes in to develop the new bulb. Then these strap-like leaves come out and they'll develop and it's important to keep these in bright sun. And again, feed the amaryllis starting about a month after it finishes flowering. Feed it every month for five or six months with a high middle number fertilizer and you'll have a beautiful flowering bulb again next year. Well, let's move to our plant clinic for a minute and take a look at a gardenia that's got a little problem with a, an insect called the mealybug. And if you can see right down in here, that little white cottony bug. Well, that's a, an insect that would infest this whole plant if we let it multiply. It's sucking the juices out of the plant and it looks like a little piece of lint on there. Well, I can take a, a, a Q-tip with some alcohol and just get rid of it that way or I could dip it in soapy water and get rid of it that way. What I'd really like to do is take it to my sink and with a flexible hose and with tepid water, take the hose and just syringe it back and forth and while I was doing I would knock that off right in my sink and it would flush down the drain then I would give the whole plant a nice shower and it would really like it and gardenias are a plant that we have to check for mealybug at pretty regular intervals now maybe I have time for just a question here's a question from Biddeford Maine two years ago I planted three grapefruit seeds fresh from the fruit the resulting plants are now of immense height the question is should I cut them back graft them or just let them go well that's the kind of a question that's really tough to answer. My guess is that you don't know what the variety really is. You don't know how big the plant will get. And I'd be inclined to say, just keep them as long as you can and just scrap them. Okay, next, we go to England where we visit the House of Rochford Greenhouses and take a look at their new venture in hydroculture. That's next on the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is provided by this station and by other public television stations.